Luna, or the moon, can have some interesting interactions. In my last video, one you should check out before watching this, I talked about the moon's phases and what causes them. However, in addition to the moon's regular phases that appear periodically, there are some other lunar events that deserve their own video. So in this episode of the Space Age, we will be breaking down rare lunar events. First of all, you might hear people call a full moon a lot of weird things. Wolf moon, sturgeon moon, harvest moon, strawberry moon for some reason. A lot of these just come from the full moon of a certain month. Here is a chart of all full moons of every month. Keep in mind that these are still normal full moons. Oh right, the harvest moon. The harvest moon is just the full moon closest to the autumnal equinox. And if I ever do a video on seasons explaining what exactly that means, I will have the card shown right about now. But here's a real quick explanation. An equinox is when day and night are the same length. There are two equinoxes in a year, and one of them occurs in autumn, hence autumnal equinox. The harvest moon is again the full moon closest to the autumnal equinox, which generally means that it replaces September's full moon or the corn moon, but it can sometimes replace October's full moon or the hunter's moon. This moon naming system works because the moon takes about a month to complete its cycle, specifically around 29.5 days, and most months are actually either 30 or 31 days long. Isn't that weird? It's almost like humans tried to match the month to the moon cycle, but then thought it was weird to stop at half a day and also wanted to have 12 months in a year, so they used 30 days and 31 days. However, the moon cycle is still shorter than most months, so sometimes we get two full moons in one month meaning that there will be 13 full moons that year. The second moon is called the blue moon and occurs once every few years, including October of this year. But don't get your hopes up, because the blue moon isn't even blue. In fact, nothing changes about this moon's appearance, and the average person probably won't even realize nor care about these. Some people also refer to a second new moon as a black moon, which I guess technically, since it's a new moon, it'll be black, but with that logic, every new moon is black, so... And next up on our list is the supermoon, which is the first moon that actually looks different compared to a normal moon. A supermoon happens when the moon is closest to the Earth in its elliptical orbit, which to scale looks like this. There are two variants of the supermoon. The super new moon, which no one really cares about because you can't see a normal new moon anyways, and the super full moon, which appears brighter and bigger than its normal counterpart. Unfortunately, if the moon is at its closest during any other phase, it's not called a supermoon. So there goes your dreams of that super waxing crescent. Contrary to the supermoon, there is the micromoon, which is a full or new moon at its farthest away from Earth in its elliptical orbit. As you would expect, the micro full moon is smaller than a normal full moon, which is smaller than a super full moon. Alright folks, now it's time to move on to what you click this video for, the eclipses. But before we dive into that, Let's go through some basics. To eclipse an object means to obscure the object by essentially blocking it from a certain perspective, similar to how the black sphere is blocking the blue one from our perspective. By doing this, you create three different viewing angles. The first is where you can't see the object being obscured at all. 
In this case, the black sphere is obscuring the blue sphere completely. This will be represented by a black shadow. Let's see what happens if you move further back. Ah, now we can see both spheres, but they still appear to be centered. This second angle will be represented with white. If we enter back to the first angle, then another way to bring the blue sphere into view is to move to the side. Then we can see both spheres, but they are not centered. This third viewing angle gets wider as we go back, while the first gets smaller. The third angle will be represented with gray, and keep in mind that we can keep our perspective still and move the spheres to get the same effect. In a solar or lunar eclipse, these three viewing angles correlate to three different types of shadows, the umbra, penumbra, and antumbra. Oh, that's interesting. We needed to move the Earth back or Moon forward in order to see it. During a solar eclipse, the Moon blocks the Sun from the Earth's perspective, and those three shadows correlate to three types of solar eclipses. A total solar eclipse is when the Moon completely overshadows the Sun. To view it, you, probably on Earth, have to be in the Moon's umbra which isn't big enough to cover the entire Earth, so you kind of have to be in the right place at the right time, or be really hardcore and get a private jet to travel with the moon's umbra. You might expect that during a total solar eclipse, it would just go dark. However, although the sun is hidden, the outer parts of the sun's atmosphere become visible. This outer region is called the, um, the corona. Oh, and now the algorithm's on my trail. The corona is normally hidden by the sun's mighty glare, but during a solar eclipse, the sun is hidden, just leaving its atmosphere. Now is probably a good time to tell you that for viewing a solar eclipse, use protective eyewear. Even during a total one, I would be kind of careful because you could be chilling, watching it, and then all of a sudden, the sun appears as the moon passes and your eyes taken out. The total solar eclipse is possible because the sun is about 400 times farther away from the earth, but the moon just so happens to be 400 times smaller than the sun, which is a lot. This could take a while probably can't see the moon anymore. But it won't always be this way, because the moon is slowly escaping the Earth's gravitational pull and won't be large enough for totality in a few hundred million years. The partial solar eclipse correlates with the moon's penumbra. You should be able to see the moon cover a bit of the sun in an off-center-like fashion. These are cool, but often get overshadowed by total and annular counterparts. Get it? Overshadow? And eclipses are about shadows? The penumbra is significantly larger than the umbra. So out of all of the solar eclipses, this is the one that you're most likely gonna see. And sometimes, because of the moon and Earth's alignment, you won't be able to get a total solar eclipse only a partial one, like in this scenario where the moon was too high. The third form of solar eclipse may actually be cooler than the total. This third solar eclipse is called an annular eclipse and is essentially when a micro-moon eclipses the sun. Luna is far enough away so that the Earth is in the moon's entumbra, meaning we can see the ring of the sun as well as the moon, kinda like a ring of fire around the moon. In addition to the three solar eclipses, there are also three lunar eclipses, where the Earth eclipses the sun from the moon's perspective.
When it comes to lunar eclipses, there are only two shadows we need to worry about, since the Earth is too large and the Moon is too close for the Moon to ever be in the Earth's antumbra. A total lunar eclipse is when the Moon is in the Earth's umbra. A penumbral lunar eclipse is when the Moon is in the Earth's penumbra. And a partial lunar eclipse is when part of the Moon is in the umbra and the rest is in the penumbra. Don't get tripped up by that, by the way. So there are two effects that the umbra and the penumbra does to the moon. Due to the sun being partially blocked, the penumbra just makes the moon a bit darker, making a fully penumbral eclipse the most underwhelming thing ever. So I got a question for you. If the penumbra, which partially blocks sunlight, dims the moon, then the umbra, which completely blocks sunlight, does what? It turns the moon red, obviously. But you know what? I'll explain. The Earth's atmosphere is made up primarily of oxygen and nitrogen, which scatter or refract light. You may have learned that as shorter a light's wavelength, the more it gets refracted. And red light, having a longer wavelength, gets significantly less misguided by this prism than blue. Particles refract all over the place in comparison to the prism, and sending a blue light through the atmosphere causes it to scatter all over the place, and there is just no way that blue light will ever make it through the Earth's atmosphere without getting diluted to the point of negligence. There's just too much atmosphere for it to go through. Compare that to a red light, which yeah, it'll get bounced around a little and exit the atmosphere in a slightly wider and diluted way than it came in, but will still be going in the same general direction. Going back to lunar eclipses, some of that red light will get refracted in the direction of the moon and then get reflected back into our eyes, making the moon appear red. Because of this, a total lunar eclipse is often also called a blood moon. A partial lunar eclipse, being in the umbra and penumbra, will have part of the moon darkened and another part red but there can often be not enough of the moon in the umbra and bounce off such little light that the umbra appears to be black. If the moon orbits on the same plane as the Earth, like how simple models like this one show, then there would be a solar and lunar eclipse for every respective full and new moon but the moon actually varies its orbital plane by up to 5 degrees, which makes eclipses a lot rarer because everything needs to line up. Alright, so that was a lot to take in, but for recap, we have the names of the 12 full moons, the harvest moon, the falsely advertised blue and black moons, super and micro moons, the three solar eclipses, and finally, the three lunar eclipses. Oh, by the way, these can stack, so get ready for that super harvest blue solar eclipse moon. Thanks for watching everyone. Make sure to do the usual, like, sub, comment if you have any questions or critiques, but I would also like to say that school will be starting in my area soon, and there may be a decrease in video production. It has been a great opening summer, and I'm doing far better than what I was expecting. Looking forward to keep making videos. See ya.